Good morning. Good morning. Giving honor to our special guests, our ministry leaders, and everybody gathered today. Can you hear me okay? Let us open our ears, our minds, our imaginations, and our souls as we listen across time and space and seek to hear this story again for the first time. Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures this morning is Isaiah 58 and 6, and also verses 9 through 12. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the throngs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. The wisdom of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning's second reading is from the epistles, Romans Chapter 13, verses 7 through 8. Pay to all what is due them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God in spirit, for the word of God among us, thanks be to God. Please pray with me. A charge to keep I have a God to glory by a never-dying soul to save and fit it for the We're talking about Negro spirituals today and a new social justice initiative 
that we're starting at the United Parish. First, let's get the name out of the way. The term Negro spirituals refers to the enormous body of folk songs created collectively by enslaved Africans in America and their descendants. In black communities, that is the preferred term for this body of music. In the predominantly white community, they are more typically called African-American spirituals, or simply spirituals. Other terms used for them are jubilee songs, named after the jubilee singers of Fisk University, sorrow songs, a term coined by W.E.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to earn a doctorate and one of the founders of the NAACP, and I think he's from Burlington, Massachusetts, too and more recently, black liturgical music, words matter. And while using the word Negro, even in this context, gives me discomfort, I can acknowledge that the discomfort is mine, and it comes from the shame I feel as a white person of privilege. I defer, I defer to the black community's preferred terminology, and I welcome the feelings of discomfort. They remind me that there is work to be done. Unlike other hymns and worship music, Negro spirituals were not published until after the names of their creators were possibly long forgotten, if they were ever even known. They are both witness to the horrors of slavery and racism and witness to a merciful, faithful, just Christianity, which we still aspire to live into today. Even before the abolition of slavery, these songs had started making their way into the collective memory of Americans. Since then, they have become the source of literally countless musical arrangements and compositions published and sold to churches and schools, community choruses, orchestras, bands, and all manner of musical organizations. The Negro spiritual is also the intellectual property of the enslaved Africans in America and their descendants. In an, act, in an excerpt from O Black and Unknown Bards, written by the black poet, lawyer, civil rights leader, and author of Lift Every Voice and Sing, James Weldon Johnson, he asks, O black and unknown bards of long ago, how came your lips to touch the sacred fire? How in your darkness did you come to know the power and beauty of the minstrel's lyre? Who first from midst his bonds lifted his eyes? Who first from out the still watch, lone and long, feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise? within his dark-kept soul, burst into song. Heart of what slave poured out such melody as steal away to Jesus on its strains? His spirit must have nightly floated free, though still about his hands he felt his chains. What merely living clod, what captive thing, could up toward God through all its darkness grope and find within its deadened heart to sing these songs of sorrow, love, and faith, and hope? How did it catch that subtle undertone, that note in music heard not with the ears? How sound the elusive reed so seldom blown, which stirs the soul or melts the heart to tears? Not that great German master in his dream of harmonies that thundered amongst the stars at the creation Eve ever heard a theme nobler than go down Moses, marks its bars. O oh, black slave singers, gone, forgot, unfamed, you, you alone, of all the long, long line of those who've sung untaught, unknown, unnamed, have stretched out upward, seeking the divine. You sang far better than you knew. The songs that for your listeners' hungry hearts suffice still live, but more than this to you belongs. You sang a race from wood and stone, to Christ. This poem sums up so many important aspects of the Negro spirituals. They are undeniably brilliant, capturing over and over again the holy grail of music that happens when artistry is matched by depth of feeling. And the feelings they communicate are universal. Few of us will ever have to experience the level of suffering that enslaved black people endured, for sure. But we can all relate to the feelings expressed in the spirituals. The result is that these songs are almost irresistible to the human spirit. Frederick Douglass, 
an escaped slave who wrote extensively about his experiences, describes them like this. When on their way home, the slaves would make the dense old woods for miles around reverberate with their wild songs, revealing all at once the highest joy and the deepest sadness. They would compose and sing as they went along, consulting neither time nor tune. I have sometimes thought that the mere hearing of those songs would do more to impress some minds with the horrible character of slavery than the reading of whole volumes of philosophy on the subject could do. It is so hard, it is so hard to understand what caused the more abusive slaveholders to be so hate-filled. How were their hearts not softened by the undeniable humanity expressed by these people, least of all in their songs? How did they not hear God's voice imploring them to turn back? For the last few years in particular, I have struggled with how to appropriately and respectfully use Negro spirituals in our worship services. They are some of the most powerful, beautiful, and expressive music that I know. My parents grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and I grew up in Nashville, and then in Knoxville, Tennessee. My father's choirs always sang arrangements of spirituals, and my mother very frequently assigned the H.T. Burley arrangements of Negro spirituals to her classical voice students. I grew up regarding the Negro spiritual as high art, and knowing that these songs are both important and deeply tragic. I never considered the possibility, though, that as a white person I shouldn't be singing them. But now, white America is waking up, once again, to the challenges and injustices faced by people of color in the US, as is evidenced by the fact that we have a sign hanging on the outside of our building explaining that black lives matter. We know that Negro spirituals came from the mouths of enslaved Africans in America. What right do we have to sing them? We're fearful of misinterpreting them, or culturally appropriating them, or just being too white to sing them. I mean, maybe true. Um, certainly can't clap. <laughs> we can try. These songs have been so deeply incorporated, however, into the canon of folk music in America that most of us don't even know which ones are Negro spirituals and which ones aren't. So let's test our knowledge. I'll start, and you pick up where I leave off. This little light of mine, swing low, I've got peace like a river, We, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. Lord, I want to be a Christian. I'm going to lay down my burdens. Down by the Go tell it on the mountain. Ezekiel saw the wheel. That's a harder one. <laughs> it's me, it's me, O oh Lord. You got it? Let us break bread together. Nobody knows when. Israel was in Egypt's land. He's got the whole world in his hand. Yep, so we have not missed one yet. Okay, <laughs> shall I keep going? I mean, you know, I've got about 20 more on my list and I'm pretty sure you'll have all of them. Maybe I shouldn't, <laughs> as fun as it is. Um, I'll just, I'll just mention them by name. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me, wade in the water, we are climbing Jacob's ladder, give me that old time religion, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, Mary had a baby, as I went down in the river to pray, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, I'm gonna sit at the welcome, welcome table, in that great getting up morning, my God is a rock in a weary land, right on King Jesus, soon and very soon, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And great day, great day, the righteous marching. That's just a few. That's just a few. 
How many of you knew that all of those songs were Negro spirituals? Yeah, you probably didn't know. I mean, like, yeah, we don't know because we they're in our they're in our consciousness. Okay, quick history review. In 1619, the first Africans were brought to America to become slaves, beginning 244 years of legalized slavery on U.S. soil. 150 years later, in 1772, John Newton, an English slave trader turned abolitionist and clergyman, wrote Amazing Grace. It would later become one of the iconic anthems in the black community, reaching its true glory in the, vo in the voice of Mahalia Jackson. 1808, slave, slave trading was abolished. Meanwhile, slavery remained legal in the US for another 55 years. 1857, the Dred Scott ruling determined that the US Constitution was not intended to protect people of African descent. 1860, this is interesting to me, the Republican Party declared the slave trade a crime against humanity as part of their presidential campaign. Apparently it didn't work. It is the first example of the term being used in this way. Nothing happened from that. 1863, the, Ap the Emancipation Proclamation freed slaves, but only in the states that had seceded from the Union. 1865, the 13th Amendment finally abolished slavery and involuntary servitude in the US after 264 years. Oh, wait, except, except when it is used as punishment for a crime. Then it's okay. 1867, three Northern abolitionists compiled and published slave songs of the United States that they collected from emancipated slaves. It's worth noting that even by 1867, the first eight, six, eight songs in that collection were commonly sung in both white and black churches. 1871, the Fisk University Jubilee Singers, made up of emancipated slaves, brought spirituals to the concert hall for the first time, raising money through their concerts to keep the university financially afloat. They actually raised $150,000 in 1871, singing spirituals. Pretty impressive. George White arranged the spirituals. He was their, their ironically, white um, treasurer. Um, he arranged the spirituals and taught, um, that they taught to him by his students for choir, and, they, and their repertoire became known as the Jubilee Songs. Other college choirs followed suit, and the Jubilee Songs were incorporated into vaudeville and minstrel shows, among other things. Skip to 1929. Harry Thacker Burley, among the first acclaimed black American composers, published Jubilee Songs of the United States, Negro spirituals arranged in classical form with piano accompaniment making spirituals available to solo concert singers as art songs for the first time. Experts estimate that there are at least 1,000 and as possibly as many as 6,000 Negro spirituals. It is impossible to know exactly how many were never transcribed. By all accounts, Negro spirituals were entirely improvised and were honed and refined according to the tastes and opinions of the group. They were passed around from one plantation to another, taking on new forms and variations as they went. Other historical accounts indicate that slaveholders recognized the strong musical tendencies of their, of their African slaves, noting that singing was incorporated into nearly every aspect of their lives. Many slave owners encouraged the singing and paid more for the best song leaders because it allowed their slaves to work harder for much longer. For the enslaved African Americans, singing was an act of self-preservation made even more powerful by the fact that it was almost always done collectively. This allowed for community building, which was especially important because the African slaves very often did not share a common language and families were very rarely together. Music conquered that. Singing was a source of strength and comfort and mental distraction from the cruelties of daily life. As an, as an act of artistic expression, singing reinforced a sense of self worth. Spirituals were utterances of the heart, expressing whatever needed to be expressed. Sadness, grief, joy, exhaustion, heartache, humor, courage, compassion, anger, frustration, fear, but most importantly, and always, hope. Singing was a form of prayer, and these prayers reveal an absolute faith in God to make things right. 
All this to say that in order to keep singing Negro, Negro spirituals, we need to address the debt we still owe to the enslaved black people who created them. Black Americans have been last in line to receive recognition and financial compensation for the extraordinary contributions they've made to American culture. Folks, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. That's what we say. Today, we as a church will begin the practice of collecting royalties retroactively for the spirituals we sing and worship. Whenever we sing Negro spirituals, we will collect an offering that will support the development of black musicians. For the next two years at minimum, we have chosen Hamilton Garrett Center for Music and Arts as the recipient of the royalties that we collect. Our guest and their executive director, Jeremy Groover Flores, will talk to us about their program in just a little while. For now, imagine, imagine if churches, schools, and music publishing companies started to pay even a small amount in royalties to organizations that empower African-American artists and musicians. If I had to guess, I would imagine that the Negro spirituals have been arranged, published, and recorded millions of times. Marching bands, handbell choirs, church choirs, college choirs, pop singers, jazz bands, community choruses, pianists, solo instrumentalists, solo artists, orchestras, they all incorporate spirituals into their repertoire in one way or another. For the individual, the cost of this kind of practice would be very minor, if even detectable, but the, but the cumulative financial outcome could be huge. Little by little, little by little, this practice could become an instrument of a larger quest for restorative justice, in which we all get a chance to participate. Would that change things? Maybe. Maybe. In her book, Life begins at the end of your comfort zone, Jackie Lewis says, keep your eyes on all that's good and beautiful and possible in the world because the stories we tell create the people we become. One more time, keep your eyes on all that's good and beautiful and possible in the world because the stories we tell create the people we become. Yes to that, I say. Love is held hostage by guilt and fear, let's be done with that. Let's find a way forward. Amen. <laughs>